Hi, I'm Loretta Bush, President and CEO for Authority Health, and today I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Senator Bullock. Welcome, Senator. Well, greetings and thank you for having me. Today we are going to talk about a very timely and important topic. Now, last month, Senator, you introduced Senate Resolution 27, and it was a very important resolution. It declared racism as a public health crisis. First, um, tell our listeners what caused you to make such a bold move, and what do you think the next steps should be? Uh, well. I don't know if it was a bold move. It's all timing. So I'm a freshman legislator, first time running, made it to the Senate. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of my issues have been behind the scenes about racism, sure. uh, e equal justice, social justice, uh, minority, inclusiveness, things like that, even when I worked in the mayor's office. So uh, as we started having these issues, we worked on some things in Lansing. Uh, auto insurance and all of these other things. But it wasn't until like the Aubrey and the George Floyd thing happened Absolutely. and COVID hit, we had uh, what I call tailgaters coming to town with AKs and AR-15s, Confederate flags waving. And the first time we weren't in Lansing because we were on a stay at home order. Right. But the next time they came, there wasn't, you know, they just were in a very uh, visceral behavior. It was just, it, you know, so there are open carry rules, but it's supposed to be with lawful intent. But once they make threats and do other things, it becomes an unlawful intent. Mm -hmm. And how we see the law enforcement agents aren't standing there with uh, riot gear, they're allowing them to do those things, but when we have marches, they come with riot gear, and then the mm -hmm. police become a gang. Mm -hmm. You know, both sides have a gang mentality, and no one wants right. to back down, which sure. turns into some things. However, as I started giving speeches on the floor about some of the racial unrest in our country, um, just prior to that, one of our Senate colleagues wore a Confederate flag mask. Oh, no. And so... <laughs> Me and many of my colleagues were disturbed by that. Of and, course you and going would be. back and forth with the Republican side, no one apologized. So as the chairman of Michigan Legislative Black Caucus, I then asked for, you know, an apology, some things. And maybe they thought it would just go away. But it grew. And then we had the second rally. Mm -hmm. And that was disturbing. But there was something that people didn't talk about. You know, if if you're a protesting or objecting to the stay home in order. Right. What do you need guns for? Absolutely. You can't shoot the virus. Can't shoot the virus. Second is, all of the other things that went on with that, uh, there was a minstrel show on the steps of the Capitol. So they had young kids, they spray painted uh, Obama's mask black as they could, yeah. and they danced to Sammy Davis Jr.'s Candyman. Mm. And so now I'm still asking my 22 colleagues across the aisle what's going on. And this is when I told them their silence makes them guilty or complicit. They may or may not be racist, but their silence, and silence is an inaction. That's right. It doesn't mean that you verbally had to say something, but what right. did you do? That's right. And so uh, I use some imagery to them about certain things. I don't need you to say anything. What I need you to do is go tackle the dude that's about to do something to me. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to open your mouth. It's an action. So, mm -hmm. But in their case, the leader of the Republican Senate hadn't said anything and no one else had really said anything. And so I just let them know that their silence is unacceptable. You can't sit on the sidelines about racism. That's right. But see, that's why I said such a bold move, because with all of those things happening and with you being a freshman, I do think that it's a bold move to come out with a resolution that says racism is a public health issue and it's a public health crisis. Because um, many times people don't make the connection between racism and the impact it has on people's physical health 
and on their mental health. So uh, even right now, when I hear you saying, you know, painting the face of our President Obama black and dancing and doing menstrual shows and all of that kind of stuff, I have a very uh, visceral reaction to that. And I feel that in my, in my body, not only in my spirit, yes. my stomach starts to quiver. And then people need to understand that that constant feeling that way, which, you know, in technical, we call that the allostatic load, yes. right? That it keeps building up year after year, moment after moment. And then people say, well, why are African Americans more susceptible to, to things yeah. like COVID? Well, you, you've described one incident, and that's incidents that happen over and over and over again. Well, the resolution, which is a concurrent resolution, that's why we made it a concurrent resolution with the House, so it's bicameral. Okay. Rep. Cynthia A. Johnson submitted it in the House, yes. and it was referred to Health Policy Committee. Okay. We, we submitted it in the, along with Erica Geis, was my co-sponsor, submitted it in the Senate. But the other thing is that I've worked in social services for over 30 years. So right. I'm really keen to these things and what is going on with our young people and uh, mental health behavior. And you know, it's taboo in the black community to go to the doctor or go get mental health. And we try to do these things at home yeah. without, we've learned over the years that we need proper care, we need proper quality care. of care. And so as we talk about this racism being a public health crisis mm -hmm. with all of the things going on and our health director, Janae Caldoun, said it. And it's like a light said, we need to present this to the Senate, yeah. to the legislature, and that will help us commit to doing something in the state of Michigan along with the governor yes. to work hand in hand with everyone. So that's why I asked for it to be bicameral and bipartisan and to pass unanimously. Mm -hmm. And so I want to work with everybody. So I pretty much work across the aisle anyway. Yeah. And so when the racial incident hit, I don't know if they knew how to take me. Because you, you, as a black man, you can either start yelling and then they go, oh, he's too aggressive. Angry black man. Or if you, if you're soft spoken, they try to explain to you the history of something. And so, I mean, I'm so is that the either angry black man or not black enough? Some, some, uh, <laughs> some of that. And uh, so as a chess player, I have to be strategic in how and when right. I say things that will make people uncomfortable. Yeah. And you got to find a way. I want you to be uncomfortable because apparently mm -hmm. you don't understand. So mm -hmm. like, let's just say the senator who wore the mask inadvertently didn't understand. I okay, then, let's say that. This, uh, let's just and, say and that. Because we have to understand the other side, too. Yeah. However, I know that at least half of the other 21 had to know mm -hmm. that it was inappropriate for him to walk out on the chamber floor with. Mm -hmm. And so my, my feelings are like, I'm more upset with them for not saying, hey, don't wear that. Yeah. That's not appropriate. Yeah. So for none of them to see it means that they need some sensitivity training if they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And that's where we go. So we get into all these other things that make, you know, the public health crisis from, you know, just living in public housing, right. growing up in, in the certain zip codes from redlining. Yep. And we can go back through the history of the Fair Housing Act. There's a reason why we have a Fair Housing Act that still hasn't been correctly administered through this country. There's, when they came up with the Freeway, the Highway Act, mm -hmm. all the freeways went through black communities. Sure. And so we got disenfranchised and, and we were disproportionately put in places where we couldn't get loans and things like that. So then you got your education system isn't getting funded properly. So let's talk about that then for a minute because you know, you've started to transition into uh, something that I was gonna ask you about and that's the whole conversation around the social determinants of health. Yeah. And for those you know, who've been in this space for a while, we've been talking about the social determinants of health, uh, 
forever. But now, you know, it seems like the conversation has been, uh, you know, lifted up uh, once again. So let's let's talk about that some more. And you know, you've you've hit on uh, many of them. And um, I'm going to, in, in a minute, I'll circle back to COVID. Yeah, because I'm going to say let, that's let, actually what it was. Yeah, yeah. Well, why don't, why don't we go there? Let's talk we about COVID and in, then talk about how the social well, determinants we, of health have impacted that. No matter what your education level, you've been hearing these things throughout your life and course, all around, yeah. you know, these, you got to take care of yourself. We got to eat right. right. These, are, you know, black folks are more susceptible to diabetes and high blood pressure and don't mm -hmm. eat pork and all of these things. COVID put the world on pause. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things are now on display in vivid live fashion. Absolutely. So the death of George Floyd, we saw it mm -hmm. in slow motion if you watched it. Yep. Aubrey, you know, we're not just being killed by the law, we're being killed by civilians. And so right. the, then because we saw the hot spots are exactly where I said they were, those red lined black communities where folks are living in public housing, mm -hmm. they have minimum wage jobs, they're frontline workers, mm -hmm. all of those things are where the hot spots were. Right. So then we started with this racial disparity task force. And then we, so while we're on pause, people are getting the information Right. differently than they would when they're just living their life, taking things for granted, the hustle and bustle. And now it's like a wake up call. We've put racism and police brutality has been on public display for the world to see, not just for America, just the world for to the see world. a defenseless black man. So these discriminatory policies have been the knee on the neck of the black community for generations, even yeah. coming out of slavery into today. So. Right. So when we look at some of these things, like the social determinants of health, and I, I really want to, you know, stay there for a while for yes. our for our listeners, because what we don't want people to think is that uh, that uh, black people don't care about their health, and that that's why we're more susceptible. You know, that we kind of like, you know, take it for granted that we're gonna have diabetes and we're gonna have hypertension, and we don't try to eat right and things like that, but. The conversation that, that you're having and that we're having today and that needs to continue to be had is that these things have been kind of systematically imposed on us by various different things like the redlining, uh, uh, neighborhoods that have been cut off from fresh fruits and yeah. vegetables, where we have neighborhoods that have an abundance of lottery and liquor uh, stores, but not an abundance yeah. of stores that have you know, fresh fruits, vegetables, meats, dairy, all of that kind of thing. And that really uh, plays into what we saw with COVID. And, and it's cross-pollination too. So mm -hmm. you can have, you, you already said, we got food deserts in the, in the black community. Absolutely. So when I go to the store, all they got is hot chips and Fago. And that's not a bad thing, but if that's what I eat every single day. Yeah, a hot nutrition. chip every now and then. <laughs> I've had a, a flaming hot Cheeto myself a time or two, but uh, I don't make it a regular part of my diet. You you're know, right. Uh, yeah. But when you're getting those things and you're on uh, the, the lunch assistance program and you're going to school to eat for breakfast and lunch, those, despite what they say, aren't, aren't very healthy meals. Right. So, you know, so yeah. we're just surviving in the community, well, especially when they take you know, all the grocery stores move out of the city. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember when we had Farmer Jack, A&P, Kroger, everything was in abundance, but then once it they- It was right on the corner of our block, so the A&P. So now you just got, you know, Jets, fast food, liquor, pizza, right on the corner, Coney, mm -hmm. and we're not eating healthy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that it's not affordable. We just, most of us can't get around and get to the suburbs. I mean, we have two Myers in the city now. Mm -hmm which is, you know, we're on the right track. And on some the right of the grocery track. stores that we touted as good grocery stores, yeah. we learned weren't very good, most of them weren't very good stewards in the community okay. as a grocery store. Mm -hmm. And so once the Myers came or there was some place to go closer, yeah. they became upset, but they had to step their game up too. It's, so you gotta stop serving us some of this stuff and bring us some better. That or we would've stayed loyal piece. to you. Yep. 
Yep. Well, what do they say? It's, it's like sh iron sharpens iron, iron right? Yes. So when other when another one came in, that made you got to step up your game you now, step which your game is a up. good and thing. So I just think that being aware, we need folks to not let up. You know, a lot of times, and and you know, you get a movement, and something happens, and everybody does what is the the mode of the day. Right. We jump on bandwagons and Black Lives Matter, and I can't breathe, and then a gesture's made and then we like go back to our normal hustle and bustle lives. Well, this is, this is different. Yeah, this is so. different. This is different. And, and how do we make sure that it's, uh, how do we make sure that it's different? I want to talk about COVID for uh, uh, just a moment though. I want to uh, say to our listeners that um, in terms of uh, COVID-19, testing is still a very important tool in our toolbox. If you need to be tested, consider our Pop-Off Family Health Center. The phone number is 313-824-1000. That's the Pop-Off Family Health Center at 313-824-1000 uh, for COVID testing. And make sure we have that information so we can put it on our websites and make sure that the other legislators have it or anybody Absolutely. else. And so we help all of them, see, you know, so we just left a testing site yeah. And they're doing just more than just COVID testing. So they're, we have to change the way that health care is implemented in the black community. I would agree with you and see, um, and that's what we're all about, because since we're a full service, and I'm not going to uh, just uh, talk about our health center. <laughs> plug. But, but uh, yeah, shameless <laughs> plug. Shameless plug. But that's what's needed, right? And that's one of the things that concerned me a little bit. Um, you know, we'll, we'll address the, uh, the, the health issue of the day, the issue du jour, but the real issue is having access ongoing to good, affordable primary care and preventative uh, physical and behavioral health care on an ongoing basis. So as much as I um, appreciate the newcomers into the COVID testing arena, uh, there are uh, many uh, health centers, the FQHCs, the teaching health centers that have been around and are going to be in the community after, uh, you know, we've gotten all adjusted to COVID, but we, we need to make sure well, that it's ongoing and uh, continuous and that we support our neighborhoods. Well, that, that presents an interesting proposition for like me, when I worked in the city, we always looked at the traditional groups who had been in the community for years and could never figure out why they never got much traction. So, some, well, when some you say do. traditional, so, so, that's the thing. Well, the or ones the non-traditional. Non-traditional non or traditional yeah. who's been in the community, mm -hmm. but they've always been funded and doing these things, and then something happens, the, 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 the health crisis du jour of the day. Other folks come in and try to capitalize and then there's this like almost a squabble, so to speak. I don't know if that really happened with COVID. Like it was such a devastating blow to the community. Healthcare across every bandwidth worked together. Yes. And so, but there have been some folks that's been around who's just been coasting. Just like I said with the grocery stores, trying to step your game up. And if you want to be right. that person, you got, as a healthcare professional agency in the community, you mm -hmm. have to really be in the community. You can't mm -hmm. coast. That's that's exactly right. And so, in order to change, you gotta get on the horse. You gotta do things that you haven't done before. You gotta get a mobile unit and come to my block. I don't have a car. Mm -hmm. My mother is legally blind. She didn't drive. Mm -hmm. So. Before then, I growing up on public assistance, I had to figure out how to get a bu catch the bus to the doctor. Mm -hmm. I played sports. I had to get a physical. I had to figure out how to get to that place. Well, I think you've pr brought up a, uh, an important point, and I'll uh, make this as a plug because you're where you are. You are in the legislature. One of the things that has really um, been a silver lining with COVID is the ability to do tele telemedicine. Telemedicine, telemedicine, telepharmacy. Yep, that has been a very big uh, plus. And hopefully I've seen some signs that that's not going to go away, being able to well, reimburse it changes that. Every, it's a game changer. You, it's a game changer. And sometimes it's a game changer. things happen that change the game. And this, yep. this COVID, again, putting us on pause and mm -hmm. really taking a look at what's going on and then the, the racial disparities that were so glaring yep. in the beginning, mm -hmm. before 
the civil unrest of racial racism it's just glaring like you know what do we do and then you start looking at the historical practices and discriminatory practices and policies that were implemented to do those very things to isolate and leave you know you can live adjacent to one neighborhood where your life expectancy is 15 20 years longer just because they got a grocery store Mm -hmm. and a better school system with a pool and athletics on it than the other All side who things. you know I live between the freeway and a, and and a, and, a, and a factory mm-hmm so you've said it so um, a little bit more just as we wrap up with COVID the the obvious disparity there with um, African Americans making up just around 14 percent of the population 40 percent of those who died mm-hmm. are from COVID clear disparity um, much to the governor's credit, she uh, organized the, the COVID uh, disport, uh, disparities, disparities Task, task force. force. What do you uh, hope and expect to see coming out of that? Well, I think uh, under the guidance of Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist is that we've broken off into smaller groups, mm-hmm. uh, like the group that's out testing today. Mm-hmm. Um, Partners are joining Ford and other people are being more uh, involved, whether it's popular or, you know, they're, they're funding things so that this doesn't seem like it's going to go away. We need to change the way we implement health care in the community. I like that. We need to find ways to reach the community in a much more aggressive manner. Mm-hmm. And then we have to find ways to bring better services to the community, whether uh, retailers, grocery stores, spas, just yeah. we, we need to change the dynamics or the dichotomy of just healthier living and things. So if all I got is soda on the corner, I'm a drink soda. Mm-hmm. But if the store sells aloe, you know, water, uh, you know, herbal teas, they're still, gonna, it, it'll change. And then we need to reach out to what I would call our uh, influencers, folks who are right. influencers, whether they're athletes or entertainers mm-hmm. or, or legislators. When we do things, they need to see why and what we're doing. You know, um, I want to be here for my kids. So uh, me and my son have been riding bike almost Perfect. daily. Um, my wife has started walking with the ladies in the neighborhood. They're walking miles a day. Um, well, I was going to ask you about that. What, what, have you had some personal uh, health changes? That well, I, it sounds like uh, some walking. And well, I'm an athlete growing up. Mm-hmm. You know, I was in the athletics. I played in high school tennis, and I, I played softball after. And every now and then, you know, life catches up with you, and you look at yourself, and you go, whew, I'm 260. <laughs> <laughs> this when this happened? So, How it, this you know, <laughs> um uh, and so you go through that. Yes. Um, my wife's been in healthcare for was, you know forever. She went to Johns Hopkins, got a public health mm-hmm. degree, then went to Michigan, got her master's in public health oh, administration. Blood. So I've lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I've lived on the West Coast. I've lived in Washington D.C. I've lived in South Florida, mm-hmm. and some of those places just generate healthier behavior. Maybe because it's hot, you gotta drink more water or you dehydrate. People are outside being more active. The Midwest is the sad area, you know, the uh, uh, seasonal affect disorder. This is true. So it's gray skies and, you know, suicide is up, we're stressed out. And and so we need to make sure you get people got releases and understand where they can get mental health. The resources have to be available in the community all the time and you can't just tell somebody go on a website or do I, I get the telemedicine but we don't have any broadband we don't have the bandwidth to do telemedicine in all the black communities it's great mm-hmm. that the school system is now giving out but isn't yeah. it great that we have a start though yes you we don't have to somewhere. figure it all out you have to start you have to do you we're have to do pioneering an existing civilization so like we're not like starting from scratch that's you right. know, like building a new house. We got to like remodel the house. Absolutely. We got to put in new fiber optic lines, the internet, the broadband, the new cable company. Yep. So we got to do the commute. So and we got to go upstream, right? Yeah. We got to go upstream. Well, I tell you, I have really enjoyed talking with you. Next time, you mentioned water, so maybe next time we'll sit down and talk about water as a, uh, 
as a public health uh, issue and the, the need to have uh, access to that. Yeah, we but have we, a whole it, different conversation about water. I was getting ready to say, water. if we start, though, we'll have to do another 20 minutes, so you have to yes. come back for that. So I'm Loretta Bush. I'm the president and CEO for Authority Health. As always, remember knowledge is power. Get COVID tested. Know your status. Thank you so much for having this interview with me with our socially distanced. Yes. And that's why we're not wearing our masks because we're socially distanced apart. Stay safe. And stay sane.